Leg four is underway, and here in Volvo Ocean Race headquarters, we're going to be talking about some of the unbelievable crew changes, plus the incredible leg start from Melbourne. It's 5,600 mile journey from Melbourne, Australia to Hong Kong, the first time the Volvo Ocean Race has visited that city, and what a brilliant send off. A fierce battle in Port Phillips Bay, an incredible start to the next journey for the seven teams of the Volvo Ocean Race. Here we are in race headquarters. We have got so much going on in this room and so much to bring you. We're gonna be talking about the crew changes, but first of all, let's get ourselves up to date. If you haven't been keeping up with everything that's been happening in the Volvo Ocean Race, here are the last three legs for you to catch up on. On leg one out of Alicante, Vestas 11th hour racing made a key move early on, jibing into the Spanish coast and making the best of the headland gains. The fleet shot through the Straits of Gibraltar in grand style, but despite a bold tactical move north by Mafre, Vestas 11th hour racing charged all the way into Lisbon for a leg one win. Leg two was a big stretch down the North and South Atlantics. The fleet made a fast passage through the doldrums. Then off Brazil, the lead changed between Mafre and Dongfeng race team. Dongfeng race team navigator Pascal Bedigari was furious with himself for leaving a jibe too late. Letting the strong Spanish team Mafre through to claim victory on leg two. Leg three from Cape Town to Melbourne was a beast. A fierce Southern Ocean low pressure system rolled over the fleet, hitting the 17s with gusts of up to 60 knots. The biggest storm the Volvo Ocean Race has seen for three editions, causing knockdowns, Chinese jibes, and Axon Abel's mast track ripping out. A huge blow to the Dutch team. Dongfeng race team again looked to have raw boat speed, but the wily Spanish Mafre waited for their moment to pounce, winning their second leg of the race so far. Mafre's success means that they currently sit at the top of the leaderboard with 29 points. Dongfeng race team and Vestas 11th hour racing, 23 apiece. Then team Brunel sits on top of the back three teams who are very close together indeed. All this meant that leg four started with a lot at stake and a very tight battle to exit Port Phillip Bay. Here comes the gun. We're off and with that, it's goodbye Australia. Hello to Hong Kong. The difference between Brunel to the left and Mafre to the far right is going to be telling as to which side of the upper part of this race course is going to pay off. Juan Vila on his knees in the middle, calling the ley line. He's got his eyes on mark number one. This team, Max and Nobel, is a huge leg. They're looking to climb back up the leaderboard. This could certainly be the leg to do it to Hong Kong. It's the trickiest leg from a standpoint of none of the teams have done this particular sail in that particular part of the world before. There'll be a lot at stake, particularly for the navigators. Hong Kong, every tack slows the boat down, as we know, that's gonna be costly. Not only that, but they're going to approach the fleet on port. No rights under the rules. Mafre just punching out. Can Mafre do anything wrong? I see more breeze to the upper right corner based on that shot, Bianca, and that's where your race leaders are.
All that action means that we have an incredibly exciting leg four ahead of us. After the fleet clear Melbourne and the southern point of Australia, we're going to be seeing the boat sailing out into some real weather and some real current as well on the eastern coast of Australia. This leg, leg four, 5,600 miles from Melbourne to Hong Kong, and the teams are going to be faced with some pretty tough decisions early on. Conrad Coleman is going to be talking us through the key moments of this race, but here is one thing to bear in mind. For the first time in the Volvo Ocean Race's history, we're going to be seeing Hong Kong on the map and all seven teams are going to have a hell of a race all the way up to that Chinese city. Well, I was mentioning Conrad Coleman. He has been pouring over all the data and getting his mind into the navigator's thought process for this leg. We are here in Volvo Ocean Race headquarters and Conrad, with all the information you've got, talk us through the challenges. All right, well, the navigators have got a lot to deal with with this one. Not only are they sailing west instead of east, but they've got reefs, they've got doldrums, they've got monsoons, they've got all sorts of craziness waiting for them. Let's have a look at what's coming up. Okay, this is where they are, down at the bottom, but this is where they're going, and this is how they're gonna get there. Basically, they've got a nice, chunky, high-pressure zone down here, so that's funneling strong winds <clears throat> that they're currently reaching with at the moment as they go around this bottom corner uh, of Australia. Keep an eye, however, on this little nugget over here. This is going to be developing into a proper storm that's going to give New Zealand a thrashing over the next couple of days, and it's going to be giving the, the navigators perfect conditions to be sailing up the coast. Um, <clears throat> If we look at the conditions on the 3rd of January, they're going to be off the coast of Sydney, sailing downwind in 25, maybe gusting 30 knots. Ideal conditions for these kind of boats. You can see this system developing here. So basically, you've got a sandwich between wind doing this and, uh, and wind doing this. And so basically, perfect, perfect conditions. Might get a little bit lumpy, however. Strong wind, uh, and then you've got the current that's sort of working its way down the coast here. The name of this, of this current, well, it's the EAC, or East Australian Current. You, you'll know that from, um, from this guy here, Finding Nemo, if you're fans. So EAC um, makes life difficult for ocean racing boats as well as turtles. Um, moving on, on the 4th, they're going to be off the coast of, uh, of Brisbane, somewhere around here. Up on the 5th at around uh, 1800 off New Caledonia as they start to head offshore away from the Australian coast. Um, what we've got coming up here, when, when we've got the, the Solomons that they need to leave to port. Lots of reef action here. So when you're in the middle of the doldrums, the navigators are going to be looking up in the sky, looking for the wind and the clouds, but also a nose very attentively in their navigation charts, keeping the boats off the rocks. Most notably, as they continue um, up through the sea here, we've got the Philippines that we leave on the, on the left again, and then finally into, uh, into Hong Kong. ETA at the moment, around the 16th or 17th uh, of January, depending on the high-pressure monsoon situation off mainland China. More of that to come later. Okay, so an unbelievable leg four coming up, but that is just the strategy and just the tactics and the demands on the navigators. But what about the sailors themselves? Well, setting themselves up for this 5,600 mile battle, the teams have made a lot of changes, 19 by our count. And here are just some of the key people that are in and are out on each of the teams, not least, Turn the tide on plastic. We've seen some big names coming off this boat and crucially some big names joining the team as well. So Lucas Chapman, Bianca Cook, Nico Lundvin, all taking the bench. Annalise Murphy, Bernardo Freitas and Brian Thompson, the big name in offshore sailing, on. Likewise with Axel Nobel. Simeon Team Point, you'll know, has had a real challenge putting together his dream team and keeping them on board the boat. Injuries as well as external factors taking their toll. But for this leg, these are the big changes. Emily Nagel, Alex Peller and Justin Ferris off. And Peter Van Newkirk, Cecil Lungert and Luke Malloy all now joining the team on the battle to Hong Kong. Sun Hong Kai Scallywag seem to be going through navigators at a hell of a rate due to injury and again, other, other fitting into the team. Antonio Freitas, Tom Clout, all taking the bench. Libby Greenhow comes on as navigator with Grant Warrington and Tristan Steele joining the team as well. Team Brunel with Bauer Becking. This is somebody who knows how to put together a very strong team in the Volvo Ocean Race. This is his eighth chance to try and win. 
He's seen Annie Lush injured, but how has he adapted to that? Well, Alberto Balzan, Louis Belkin, along with Annie Lush and Peter Berling all off, Sam Newton, Jen Zolma, Rome Kirby and Sally Barco taking their places on the water. Well, big news for fans of Vestas 11th Hour Racing. Charlie Enright is having to sit leg four out due to a bit of a family emergency, but he leaves a very strong team in his stead. So Charlie Enright is off the boat, Jenemai Hansen also taking a rest, Phil Harmer and Hannah Diamond on board to take up the slack. Now the big hitters, Dong Fong Racing. This is the team that were leading so much of the race and had such a strong pedigree, but are they just trying to make those final few tweaks? Some key movement on board this Chinese French team. Pascal Bedigari, the navigator off, Luo Shuer, Fabien Delahaye and Marie Rue all joining him on the shore. Frank Camas now on board with Daryl Winslang, Chen Jin Hao, and Justin Matru taking up those places. For the Spanish boat, no changes. They're in the lead and their formula is working very well. Right, Conrad, join me up here. Let's talk through some of these big changes here. We have had so much movement leading into leg four and there's so many crew changes to talk through, but let's just talk about some of the big ones. Obviously, let's start with Dong Fong race team. Uh, four changes on board that boat. Pascal Bedigari, off. That's a big blow to any team. This is somebody who's got a lot of experience, but Frank Camas now on. Well, well, yes, but remember the relationship between Pascal and Charles has been building up of uh, not only the last edition of the race, but all of the preparation that they've been doing uh, leading up to this one. So that dynamic is really, really important. However, uh, Franck Camas is really the only person that can step up into his shoes. He's, he's uh, just coming out of the America's Cup. Uh, he's typically known as an offshore skipper himself. And so he, he himself has flagged, you know, it might be a little bit weird for him to be in this position, not calling the shots himself. Um, however, um, Charles and, and he worked together um, to, to win the last edition with the Volvo 70s, the 11-12 race. Uh, it worked well for them then, last time when the roles were reversed, so I'm curious to see and excited to see uh, Frank back offshore. And, and it really is, that's a team that just needs one tiny little tweak because they have been leading, they have been nipping yeah. at the heels of a leg win the whole way through. Let me, let me now talk to you uh, about another interesting one, Sun Hung Kai Scallywag, again they've had two changes, but there's a crucial change there, they, they have one extra person coming on board. The navigator, Antonio yeah. uh, Fontas, he was off, he hurt his arm. Now Libby Greenhouse right, this, on. This is really um, a big, big opportunity for this team. So it's an Australian Hong Kong team. This leg is the one that bridges their two home ports. Uh, and so a big opportunity. Uh, also a change of strategy. Not only are they going with a more experienced navigator with, uh, with Libby Greenhall, who uh, most notably navigated uh, SCA last time round, um, but we're also seeing another woman step on board. So they're joining the ranks of uh, bringing more people on board. Maybe they're starting to realize that these boats are physical beasts, that they, they can't do it with only eight pairs of hands, and that this tricky transition through the doldrums up by the Solomon Islands, they're going to need all the help and all the hands that they can get. And possibly a little bit of attrition, people getting tired. Mm -hmm. You need that little extra pair of hands. Okay, last one then. A, a big one in, in my mind. Turn the tide on plastic. Nico Lundvin, a navigator who's done a great job uh, with that boat, off Brian Thompson, the man himself, yep. now on. Well, again, he's been noticed, uh, or he's been, he's noted for being an incredible navigator, an incredible skipper offshore. He's got so many around the world races and most notably world, champion, um, world, world championships and world speed records to his name than, you know, his... His sailing CV is as long as a toilet roll, basically. Um, he was actually signed up to be the primary navigator for this team. Because he's such a rock star, he was off sailing with a bunch of other boats in the preparation phase for this race. Uh, he actually broke his leg just before the Transpac race on a big trimaran. Uh, and so his convalescence is over now. Nico Linvin needs to go home and, uh, and meet his, uh, his new baby. Uh, and so I think from, from now on, the strategy is that Nico and, uh, and Brian are going to be sw swapping out leg for leg, or more or less, they're going to be sharing the rest of the race. Uh, but this is a great opportunity for uh, primarily the youngsters on board to really learn from one of the most experienced uh, British sailors in, in the offshore world. And it would be, face to, it would be it's sensible to assume that uh, he's had, Brian Thompson's had a lot 
to do in the background with this team, feeding information forward, as we do with all the teams. And one team that now have a very strong person on the shore side, mm -hmm. looking over everything, Charlie Enright. I mean, obviously, this is not what anybody wanted from Vesta's 11th Hour Racing. The skipper, the co-founder, having to take the back seat. And that's, the team were upbeat, but it's big shoes to fill. Well, uh, yes, absolutely, absolutely. You know, Charlie uh, and Mark have been fundamental in putting these teams together. And, and actually, um, he's actually the, the best skipper, if you will, uh, to, to take a leg out because um, they've got this, this cell uh, with, uh, with Charlie and, and Mark putting this team together. Um, they have been making all of the critical decisions, uh, both at sea and onshore, and assembling this, uh, this team together. And so it's almost like a co... Maybe I'll get in trouble for saying this, but a, a co-skipper role anyway. Um, and so having Charlie step out, we've got Mark uh, stepping forward. It's his opportunity to, uh, to deal not only with the team logistics and, and management role, but also making the decisions at sea. Uh, so this is a great opportunity for him. And I think that when Charlie comes back, he's going to find the team in great shape. Absolutely. Well, we are going to be keeping an eye on all the boats on leg four, and I'm sure you guys are as well. Let us know of any major crew changes you think we've missed that are worth mentioning, ones that are going to make a big difference to the teams. We're going to be back tomorrow morning with another quick fix and then another daily show at 1300 UTC. Hopefully we're going to be talking to some of the sailors if they haven't got too much on. Let us know some of the questions that you want answered, and we will see you tomorrow.